hello, hello, everyone. Thank you for being patient. We were dealing with some technical difficult. Oh, I'm hearing myself. Um, that's how like scattered my brain is right now. We were dealing with some technical difficulties and my husband had to come here with the kids to figure it out. And so now I'm here and wow, um, I am going through the motions just probably like everyone else, especially as a survivor. This was a lot today. This was a lot today. And, you know, it's a lot to process and reflect on and speak about. Because today I thought, and yes, definitely trigger warning, like my mom just said in the chat. Um, you know, today I thought I was going to be talking about a lot of different subjects, which is interesting because I was going to be speaking about Corey Feldman for a little bit of this episode. And then this happened and it's all kind of intertwined, to be honest. And so I had to put the original episode to the side um, and change it to Thursday and just address what has come out today. And I just want to say hello to new members. Hello to new members. Thank you for being here. Thank you to everyone here in the chat. Um, for those who are new here, um, this is Eat Predators Daily. I'm your host, Alexa Nicholas. Um, I was preparing myself for this today. You know, I came forward about my own personal story when it came to Nickelodeon and Dan Schneider in 2019. I left some things out because it's always, it's always very scary to be the first person to say something. And we don't talk about that enough. When you have to be the first person to talk about ABUSC, especially when it comes to a public figure, it's terrifying. And so I still took the leap and talked about it a little bit in 2019 on a live actually with my husband before he became my husband. And this was during the Zoe 101 reunion. And when I look back, that was obviously pre-kids a lot of things. And when I look back at that time, I would never think we would be here today. Or even I would be here today with a very different perspective than I had back then. We talk a lot about rotten apples here on the show and how institutions love to use the whole rotten apple theory to deflect their complicity when it came to enabling those rotten apples. <sighs> Sorry, I'm feeling so many different Oh my God, Christian remembers that live. <laughs> that was so long ago. When Jeanette McCurdy came out with her book, that was 
huge. And I can only speak for myself. It was big for me because I think like any survivor, you always think you're the only one, right? You always think, oh, maybe it just happened to me. And what ends up happening with that feeling is that you can blame yourself. You know, you start, and it's honestly horrible for your mental health. So when Jeanette McCurdy's book came out, it was a huge exhale. She's very brave. And again, I can't stress enough that it's sad that her book, the press really centered Dan Schneider when it came to her incredible book. Really, her testimony on her life should be where we give the praise. But nonetheless, press did circle around what she had to say about the creator, about Dan Schneider. And I protested Nickelodeon, and that happened. And I really was at a point in my life where I couldn't stress enough that these institutions, the industry itself, is the problem. Is the problem. And they're a lot more involved in all of this than they want people to believe. And the Me Too movement happened for, you know, honestly, specifically women when it came to the industry. But child stars weren't quite at the center of all of this yet until now. And what's really important about all of this is that childhood trauma sculpts your adult years, whether you like it or not, honestly. It can shape and create who and how you end up showing up in the world. And I think most people have childhood trauma of some kind. And then when you become an adult, those experiences start to dictate your life in a lot of ways. And if we, I mean, no thanks to America, we don't really have any support when it comes to mental health um, whatsoever. But when we don't have therapy, when we don't have community support, when we don't have those around us that support us to reflect on our childhood trauma, we can end up recycling it and inflicting it upon others. And sometimes it's minor, like sometimes it's just how your anger management is or the way that you don't trust someone in a relationship or the way that you can self-sabotage because you don't think that you deserve good things. Childhood trauma shows up in our lives. And why it's so important to reflect on our childhoods is because I really do believe that the only way we're going to change the world is through breaking the cycle of abuse. And it really starts with us. And I think that's why we can end up getting so triggered by others when we see them recycling trauma, right? 
and we can get outraged and angry and want to punish them or, you know, want to shame them. Um, but I think at the same time, if we're going to want to see other people stop recycling trauma and inflicting it onto other people, we have to take a hard look at ourselves and how our own personal trauma ends up getting recycled in our own lives. And it's really hard. It's really hard. It's not easy. <laughs> it's not easy at all. And, you know, that's why I mention a lot about cycle breaking here, because I think really at the end of the day, survivors end up having two choices that they get left with. And that is either stopping the cycle of abuse or recreating it. And you have to remember that sometimes, and I don't know, I'm not an expert, right? But I feel like sometimes a lot of survivors are so disregarded within their communities and mistreated and obviously traumatized that they will try to recreate what happened to them to gain control over the traumatic event. And it's a way of coping and it doesn't excuse the behavior at all. <laughs> But it does give us insight into the cycle of abuse. And that's why I chose to honestly start showing up here and doing the show is because I think the first step in breaking the cycle is creating community and allowing survivors to feel believed and seen and heard. Because I think a lot of the re-traumatization for survivors that can make them recycle their, you know, abuse is that lack of community. That goes for everyone. We all need community. So much so that I feel like we don't even know how to show up in it because we're so divided as people, and I think purposefully, to the point where when community is available, we don't even know how to show up in it. And usually when something's extremely uncomfortable and difficult, it means that some place that we should start paying attention to or start working on. Usually the most empowering things are difficult and uncomfortable. And I came to learn that. But I also came to learn, obviously, survivors are traumatized and trust issues already exist. And it's very hard to come into community with survivors, but still, I believe it's the most important. And so that's why I show up here, because I know a lot of my personal sadness, and I can only speak for myself, right? But my own personal sadness and anger comes from feeling alone about what happened to me. And if I look back at my childhood, 
a lot of my hurt came from feeling alone or not feeling validated or not feeling seen and heard. And so I think we humans and validate one another's experience because we all have trauma. We all have trauma. And the sad part about, I think, being a child star is that everyone feels like they have um, access to you. And what they want to see from you has to be regarded and has to be heard more so than I think the person who is the child star. And when I was online looking at, you know, what everyone's saying about today, you know, I think we forget just because someone's a public figure doesn't mean they're not just human and have their own trauma. Yeah, there's privileges there for sure. 100%. But trauma is trauma. And it exists for them too. But I'm having a hard time processing today because we all know that I've done an episode when it comes to Drake Bell and the accusations against Drake Bell, which I do want to say once again, that trauma explains behavior, but it does not excuse it. And we need to understand that there is probably a high chance when it comes to abusive individuals that they were harmed once upon a time too. And that's hard. Like, just even for myself as a survivor, you know, when I think about people that have harmed me, the last thing I honestly want to think about is them being harmed, you know, or that cycle. It's, it's hard to because it doesn't excuse the behavior. Nothing excuses abusive behavior. Nothing. But I do think we need to start creating space for conversations around the cycle of abuse. Sad. Just very sad. So when I was seeing on my Twitter that, you know, people are having to obviously mention that Drake Bell has his accusations and um, I just think it was very brave of Drake Bell. And I'm not excusing his behavior, but I know how hard it is to tell your story and how scary it is and how people are gonna react. And there's a lot of shame that's associated with it. And this is not excusing his behavior. And though, I would like to acknowledge his childhood self that was harmed by someone that he trusted. That's very real. That's scary and very traumatizing. And it took a lot, probably, for him to share his story, especially considering the fact that everyone knows about the accusations when it comes to Drake Bell. I don't know what I would honestly do in his position. I can't really imagine it at all. Um, but I must say that it, as a survivor, I know that that was very hard. And I just want to say 
before we start diving into this, that we can hold space for both things to be true. We can hold space for someone to be a survivor and for someone to be an abuser. We can, we actually must hold space for that if we want to at all change the cycle of abuse. We must look at that and we have to actually take a very hard look at it and how we personally contribute to the cycle because community also participates in it too. We all are a part of the cycle and it ends with us. I really truly believe it does. Whew, okay, how is everyone doing? <laughs> this is just a hard, um, and I do wanna say like Nickelodeon um, really pisses me off. They have pissed me off for so many years because like I said on my protest sign, uh, when was this, in, in, in 2022, Hopefully I'm getting this year right. You know, Nickelodeon didn't protect me. And they didn't. Nickelodeon didn't protect any of us. At all. They had a responsibility and they failed at that responsibility miserably. Damaging. Lifelong trauma. Horrific. And to be honest with you, that's Hollywood at large. Like, that's just the entertainment industry. It's honestly our government, too. That's another story. All institutions fail us. Capitalism. <laughs> All of it fails us miserably. All of our trauma honestly stems, you know, from power corrupting absolutely. And we all suffer from that. We're all, our trauma somewhat stems from a result of exactly that. And the cycle never ends. And Hollywood, when it comes to children, which is why I'm gonna say it for the last time here, well, probably not the last time, but I'm gonna say it again. I don't believe in child actors because I don't believe in child labor. I believe it's a child labor issue. If we don't believe a child should be working at, you know, Starbucks, for example, why are they showing up on set? I don't get it. Child labor issue. Kids are supposed to be having no pressure when it comes to, fine. well, you know, finances happen in a family scenario, but I'm talking about their own personal financial burden from their own work. Kids should not have to experience that whatsoever. They should be playing with friends. They should be exploring their imagination. They should be feeling loved and supported. They shouldn't feel any pressure to perform, to be some. And maybe if kids like to pretend to be other people, right? With pretend, you know, playing pretend, being other people. I don't believe that adults should pressure them when to turn on their imagination. Because that becomes a societal coercion on someone's imagination. And I think it's damaging because I believe that your imagination should be protected at all costs because that's what dreams great things into becoming a reality. And anyone that fucks with someone's imagination is a problem. So when I think back at my own childhood and I think about my own imagination being a financial gain for a capitalist, for some adult at the top, it makes me want to barf, honestly. And there is a crossover into our own adult lives, our nine to five for capitalists. It all intertwines. But specifically right now, I'm talking and the impact that can have because childhood trauma creates the adults we see in the world. So childhood especially needs to be protected at all costs and not be exploited. This. I'm just going to throw this little tidbit in there, uh, Go. but, but, um, uh, yeah, like 
it, it, like you, I mean, you were just saying it, but it all stems from capitalism. It's all it just, it's all just uh, it like capitalism is the root, and the idea of capitalism is just to exploit, exploit, exploit. Correct. And so, Correct. I mean, n nobody's safe. Nothing and nobody is safe unless unless you are the one exploiting. Correct, and not even not just safe, but not sacred. Nothing is sacred when it comes to capitalism. Nothing. Except money. Except money. Profits. Profits. Nothing. Nothing is sacred. Nothing is cherished. So when you think about being a child who is making money, and I just want to say right here, by the way, I got no residuals from Nickelodeon. Not a dime for all of those hours of child exploitation, child labor, years out of school, for what? Nothing, not even one cent. It's interesting because sometimes I'll get like a residual check from, I don't know, Mad Men or something, and it'll be like, you know, $15, or sometimes I'll get one that's like one cent, and you know, my husband will be like, wow, that's embarrassing in the sense of like, to these companies that are paying literally one cent um, for a residual. And the, I always tell him- The postage costs more than that. Yes, <laughs> everything, the paper, everything is a waste. And I always tell him though, Nickelodeon has given me zero. And I was a child working my ass off for a company that didn't give a fuck about anybody who pretends that they care about children when they absolutely do not. All they care about is ad revenue and brooming children into cap. And what do broomers always say? We, I care about children. Eh. First red flag. Why? Why are you caring about children? And it's not only just desensitizing children to predatory behavior that Nickelodeon does, but it also brooms them into consumerism, into capitalism. And that's why an episode of a Nickelodeon show, for example, is actually less time than the commercial ad breaks. What kids are actually consuming more so than the actual television show they're thinking they're watching is the ads. And then children start going, I want Go-Gurt out of nowhere, you know, or I want this, or I want that, or I want this new plastic toy that, you know, a child is making in another country because Nickelodeon is allowing children to not only be desensitized to predatory behavior, but to be broomed into capitalism. And that's why I hate them. I mean, today makes me really hate them more, to be honest, after hearing Bell. And also, it's also a lot bigger than that. What these corporations do to all of us is disgraceful. It rots our minds. Not even our minds, but our spirit too, or whatever that is, right? What makes us care about one another? It... And they don't care. They don't care at all. And so anyways, what I was originally saying is that there should be no such thing as a child star. It should be illegal in the same way that child labor laws exist for a reason. And Alison Stoner has done such an incredible job on Hollywood, which has honestly had me thinking for weeks now about a lot of the things that she had to say, or they had to say, sorry, they had to say um, when it came to the industry. And it's so true. Not only is it impacting these individual children that are getting put into this, I don't even know how, this power position, honestly, but how it also affects all of us and how we view these children, how we view these people, 
how we can have parasocial dynamics with them, how they can start to dictate what we wear. I mean, the layers of it is just deep. It's deep. And I don't think we're ever going to necessarily unravel it in my lifetime. Um, but I do finally see the needle moving when it comes to humanizing people that we dehumanize. That seems to be the era right now. In all regards. I don't know what's in the stars, honestly. But it's about humanizing people again. We have gotten so caught up in some strange cycle through colonialism and capitalism and all of it <laughs> where we dehumanize one another. And that is part of the cycle of abuse because the minute that we objectify living beings, that's when we no longer see them as human. We see them as an object. And that's what I believe capitalism wants us to, to perceive is objects not life. And that's how the cycle continues. Because if we're not seeing life and we're seeing objects, we can treat them differently. We can treat things differently. We detach or we disassociate because of how we're perceiving the, the being in front of us. Sorry, I know my mind's going in so many different directions, but I think it's very important to, to say this because Drake Bell's story is important for more reasons than one. And it's about how the industry has treated those that work for it and how they have been not only abused but how this and how they show one image to the public and it's very different than what's actually taking place behind the scenes ah <sighs> so here we are i'm i'm going to be reading a little bit about what came out in the news today when it comes to Drake Bell. And I just want to say for everyone here, you know, let's be mindful. We can hold space for both things to exist. We can hold space for Drake Bell to be not a cycle breaker. Maybe he's starting to cycle break. Who knows, right? But we can hold space for at least his story. Just like we all deserve a community to hold space for our stories. And so let's just be mindful because I know that there are survivors out there that are watching all of us and seeing how we're communicating with one another on social media. And yeah, we're going to be getting into Brian Peck too. I mean, Brian Peck is absolutely disgusting. Like legit despicable. Actually, can someone send me the link in the chat? for that Ray Romano, do you, do you know what I'm talking about? That Ray Romano episode with Brian Peck. I just, I, I kind of want to show it because, wait, where is that? I feel like, oh, and by the way, you guys, we're, we are protesting Nickelodeon on the 19th. And now I'm really going to be protesting Nickelodeon on the 19th. I mean, I was always really going to be protesting, but I am so upset. Um, and I'm sure I'm going to be even more upset when I hear Drake Bell tell his story. But we are protesting on the 19th. And so if anyone wants to join us and stand in solidarity respectfully, it's going to be in front of the Nickelodeon building on, in, in Burbank. <sighs> I'm trying to find this. Does anyone have the link by any chance because I just want to show it because it really kind of shows what are you looking for I'm looking for it was on our reddit where it was Brian Peck and this Ray Romano maybe I can find it here hold on Brian Peck Ray Romano here it is wait I think here it is a TikTok of it hold on let me see if I can if I can pull this up Okay. God, TikTok with its um Okay. 
There we go. Okay, let's watch this for a second. I just want to show this because I thought it was pretty, like, what, what, what the hell is this? And now, you know, I, I just want to show this because I don't believe personally that the adults around Brian Peck, Nickelodeon at large, wasn't aware of his um, predatory behavior. Because what I've noticed, honestly, in Hollywood when it comes to predators is that it becomes this big inside, like, open secret that becomes an inside joke. Do you know what I mean? It's an open secret that becomes an inside joke. And if you follow sometimes a lot of the predators that have been called out, you'll see them playing themselves in a lot of ways or hints at that in television. And I have a long list of this, which we're not getting into today. But I want to show this because I find it pretty appalling that this was on, um, I think it was all that. So let's watch this. Oh, wait, is it not playing? Oh, my audio is off. Okay, okay, okay. I can't. A pickle. Thank you. Oh, I don't know who you are, but this pickle is the best thing that ever happened to me. <laughs> oh. Oh. That's good pickle. Oh, yeah. Do you know what I mean? Did everyone else see that? That's Brian Peck, by the way. The pickle. I, I can't even say, because I've been talking about this when it comes to Zoe 101 and the goo pop, right? And let's just say it. Do you guys know? I I'm going to say it. Can I just say it? You know, Glory, H-O-L-E. Right? Everyone knows what that is, sadly. Glory, H-O-L-E. It's a whole fetish or whatever. Okay. Well, did you all see what I just watched? Anyone see that? And who it is, and a pickle, and they see Ray Romano, how he's eating it. For, it, it these are the innuendos that keep showing up, specifically when it comes to Nickelodeon. I don't really honestly see it as much when it comes to Disney. I don't. I see it a lot more when it comes to Nickelodeon, and it's disturbing. It's honestly disturbing what they let slide and what they've allowed for so many years. And let's not forget, Brian Peck was friends with Dan Schneider. Right, Dan? You know who Brian is, right? You know who Brian is. Um, but not even just that. Even after going to jail for this, studios ended up hiring him. Studios ended up hiring him around children. And so shame on you, Disney. Actually, hold on. Sweet Life of Zack and Cody. Shame on you. You hired Brian Peck after knowing on a kid show? And you're like, it's okay. Like, he's just going to be the voice. At least he doesn't have, like, actual physical con Why are you hiring him at all when it comes to a kid show? Shame on you, Disney. Where's your background checks, by the way? Where are they? You're not doing background checks for with children involved? And that's why I say this a whole bunch too when it came to Ian 
bringing me into the trailer with Brittany and Jamie. Thank God it was just Brittany and Jamie. But what if it wasn't Brittany and Jamie? And this is why when there's kids involved, when there's anyone involved, but let's just say focus on children. You gotta, you gotta, there needs to be protection there. There needs to be standards. There needs to be, because look at what's been happening. And let's not forget Brian Peck is the mirror on Sweet Life of Zach and Cody. The frickin' mirror. And then he's in all these, I looked at his IMDb. He mostly works on kids' movies. What? His resume is mostly, even as of recent, kids' movies. That's like possible child endangerment. But Hollywood doesn't care. They really, because in my personal opinion, it's a predator club. It's always been that way. It's been that way for a very long time. Predators protect other predators. Predatory behavior protects other predatory behavior, not even when it comes to SA, when it comes to just straight up predatory ideology. It's all protected. It's part of capitalism, honestly, but it's all part of the same thing real it's really really real and it is gross he's still working oh yeah yeah let's i did a brian peck um episode actually um recently when it came to let's look it up okay here he is I, it, just trigger warning obviously this guy is a pdf file pdf file here he is here wait actually don't show my Wait, don't show my screen for one second. I'm just gonna close out um, this so that I can actually move this a little bit. Okay, so here we go. You can show my screen. All right, so here's Brian Peck. Let's let's see, let, let's look at it really quickly. So 2018, I guess, was his last um, project, this thing called Animal Showdown. But let's look at here. So 2009, that was after he has already been, um, right, convicted, whatever. Um, he's doing a, a kid's show, a kid's movie called Jack and the Beanstalk. Let's look. Kids. Who the hell is this director? Gary J. Tunicliffe, whatever your last name is, bro. What, what are you doing? What are you doing? Do you, do you understand that you are responsible for a cast of children and you're hiring somebody who is a PDF file? I mean, he, he doesn't care. No, of course not. He doesn't care. <clears throat> but this is why you need to get them to care. You need to get them to care because we're talking about children understand that there are consequences also for their behavior right, exactly. because enablers get to be like, me, like whatever. And they just like skate on by when really these people, the predators don't get access to victims without someone giving them a platform to do it. And so whatever his name is here, Whatever, clit, whatever Jack and the Beanstalk person, um, Gary J. Tunicliffe, like, dude, you know, you are creating a platform. Access to children. To somebody who is a PDF file. Shame on you. And this happens a lot. By the way, there's apparently some um, PDF file, allegedly, um, who wrote Jeepers Creepers and also worked for Disney. Does anyone know who I'm talking about? He's like a director, he wrote Jeepers Creepers. He also did a Disney, uh, we can get out of my full screen. Um, it did this, whatever, it was, I think it was like a Disney film. I don't know if anyone knows what I'm talking about. But it was a Disney film. And same thing, I think went to jail, you know? And here they are in Hollywood, you know, doing their thing. And 
it needs to end. <laughs> it needs to end. We need to take it very seriously because we have to understand as a community how we can be complicit when it comes to allow giving access, giving victims to predators. We have to be aware of that, that we as a community also have our own responsibility and community loves to run to the predator. But community, we all participate in this cycle of abuse, whether we like it or not. It's a reality. So we need to get better. We need to get smarter. And we need to get kinder when it comes to these issues. So moving on, let's go into Drake Bell. I, I'm gonna read, I'm gonna read, it's really, it's, yeah, no, it, it is. Okay. You wanna do that? I know that Miko said that when you pause it, you can just begin it again to not end broadcast, like just stop the streaming and then you can go back onto it. Okay, we're gonna be right back because I guess something just happened. And so one moment. <laughs> no, it's super laggy. We're, we're coming back now. We're coming back. We're, we're coming back now. We're coming back. I'm back, I'm back, I'm back, I'm back. Let me know if everything is okay, if you can see me. Let's see. <sighs> I feel like we should really be putting some Elcon Hubbard uh, stickers or whatever emotes in the chat. I don't think, can anyone see me? I don't think so. Can you? No. It's like stalling in my YouTube. It looks like it like is, it looks like, oh, it uploaded. No. Are you serious? Oh, it looks like it ended the broadcast. How did it end? Really? No, I'm paused here, I think. Really? I'm not moving on my screen, on the YouTube screen, am I? Wait, let's see. Let's see. Let's see. I have no idea. My screen. Is it? Can people see me? Yes, they can. <clears throat> What is happening? <laughs> yeah, I think that's that's where we're it out. Are we showing my screen? Okay, so let's see. So former Nickelodeon star Drake Bell speaks out about being essayed as a 15-year-old child actor. 
it's laggy again. Drake Bell is speaking out for the first time about S.A. He says he experienced as a 15-year-old child star. Are we good now? I, I shouldn't even start until maybe we just have like a clear. We're good? Okay. Okay, great, great, great. Do, do, do. I'm good. I'm not lagging. <laughs> um, yeah, I see someone saying like, sorry, I don't like him. And it's like. Listen, we 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 know that you know he could harm somebody and at the same time be a survivor. And I also think actually let's just go full screen for a second cuz I I do want to address the community about this. You don't need survivors don't need you to like them. First and foremost, I don't think it helps or does any service to survivors at large when we constantly want them to be likable. It creates stigma around being a victim of abuse. Sometimes people that we really don't like or who aren't good people be a victim of abuse. And that's a sad reality. That is a face that a lot more. Because you're a survivor doesn't mean all of a sudden you're a great person or oh, you're a survivor so you just get a pass on everything you do in life. No, that's, that's, oh, I'm, I'm frozen, someone said. What happened? But how did it get bumped to a higher res? Just because we hit it? Okay. I just don't want any of that to be missed because it's really important what I'm trying to say here. Um, am I lagging? <laughs> okay, I'm good. So basically what I was saying is that we need to get out of that. That means like they just have like a clear pass. Like, oh, you're a survivor. You can't do no harm. You're that. That needs to go because I also think it puts a lot of pressure onto survivors in general that they feel like they have to be perfect to be believed. Which is why, for me personally, I made that decision when it came to you know power to survivors. I knew I I would hear a lot more from nonprofits or from so many different people like believe survivors. And that was really like a, a slogan for a while. And I got so sick of asking people to believe me or to believe a survivor because then you have to check all these boxes to be believed. And I think it's more important to give the power to survivors, to empower them, to be able to tell their story and to seek justice as a community. We have a responsibility as a community to empower survivors. And so that's why I chose Power to Survivors. And we have to understand that not every survivor we're going to like. Not every survivor we're going to get along with. Not every survivor uh, we're, we're going to want to go to coffee or, you know what I mean, to dinner with. That's just not a reality. Does that change the fact that they're a survivor? No. they're still a survivor. And I think it's really important for us to be there. Um, I see someone said, Ali, just because Drake Bell was in charge with SA doesn't mean he didn't do it. The survivor was very emotional when she read her testimony and he was smirking the whole time, correct. And that was something I did a whole video about, was talking about, you know, Drake Bell and that court footage. I was not happy with that court footage. That was very triggering. It wasn't okay. I did not like what I was necessarily seeing whatsoever. Um, but this is why this conversation is important today so that we can actually start to look at sometimes the cycle of these things and where it maybe can start and then how it ends up showing up in people's lives and being inflicted on to others. And yes, let's please be respectful in the chat. Okay, so let's get into this. So we got business insider Kate Taylor. Kate Taylor, you're amazing. 
You're so amazing. And um, so, yeah, so Kay Taylor wrote this article. So it says, Drake Bell is speaking out for the first time about SA he says he experienced as a 15-year-old child star. You're fine. So Drake Bell is speaking out for the first time about SA. Oh, shit. <laughs> it's been a minute. Okay, so Bell is sharing his story in the coming investigation discovery series, Quiet on Set, The Dark Side of Kids TV, set to air March 17th and 18th. In the documentary, Bell says he was ABUSED by Brian Peck, a dialogue coach who worked on Nickelodeon's All That and The Amanda Show. Bell starred on The Amanda Show from 1999 to 2002 before landing his own Nickelodeon series, Drake and Josh, which debuted in 2004. Peck was arrested in August 2003 on 11 charges related to allegations that he'd essayed an unnamed child. In May 2004, Peck pleaded no con contest to performing a lewd act with um, 14 or 15 year old and blank, blank, blank with a minor under 16. He was sentenced to 16 months in prison and ordered to registered as a SO in October, 2004. What episode was it? Sweet life of Zach and Cody. I want someone to say in the chat. Um, I'm very curious to know when he was working on sweet life of Zach and Cody as a registered SO. For more than two decades, Bell has remained anonymous as the minor in that case. Quiet on Set, produced by Maxine Productions, incredible production company, and Sony Pictures Television, nonfiction in association with Business Insider, examines the toxic underpinnings of iconic children's television shows created by Dan Schneider in the 90s and early 2000s. The docuseries is directed by Mary Robertson and Emma Schwartz, in 2022, B.I. published an investigation into Schneider's children's TV empire, former child actors and crew members who worked on shows including The Amanda Show, Zoe 101, and Victorious, told B.I. that Schneider created an uncomfortable, bizarre environment on set. In 2000, a writer on The Amanda Show filed a gender discrimination and hostile work plays claim saying that Schneider persistently requested massages, according to people with knowledge who said the case was settled out of court for an undisclosed amount. Others told BI that Schneider wrote as scenes and campaigned for young female stars to wear skimpy outfits. Schneider parted ways with Nickelodeon in 2018. Russell Hicks, Nickelodeon's former president of content and production, said in a statement to BI in 2022 that all of Schneider's work was carefully scrutinized and approved. I love Russell Hicks th throwing Nickelodeon under the bus, letting us know that Nickelodeon was actually approving of all this obscene behavior, obscene footage that was getting shown to children. And that children were actually doing, being directed by Dan Schneider. I love that Russell Hicks was like Nickelodeon approved and scrutinized everything. Good to know. Good to know. Christina. I think I see Christina here. Um, Amanda Bynes is great and hope there's a movement supporting her too, along with it all. I agree. I think every child star definitely deserves that support. Um, because it really is not easy being a child. I mean, there are privileges that come with the industry and being within it. Nonetheless, though, right, it's still rough being a child star in the sense where, for example, we're going to hear what Drake Bell went through. We're going to hear what so many different kids had, ha you know, experienced at the hands of adults or adults around. And nonetheless, it's still trauma. Child stars still experience trauma, but the, the really scary part about being a child star who is experiencing trauma is that the whole world has to witness it. The whole world gains access to their trauma. 
And then because that person is a public figure, then everyone feels like their opinion about it matters. And that can be extremely re-traumatizing for anyone who has been abused, right? Right? Amanda Bynes is great. And power to Amanda Bynes. Power, honestly, to anybody who works in um, a capitalistic society. <laughs> Wait, what's happening? I'm so confused. I'm sorry. I just don't see myself on this screen here, but am I... I feel like this is what's happening. I, is there a way to show me on the screen here in front? Yeah, no, it's not. That's why I'm like, am I here or am I? No one wants me to stream this episode. <laughs> it's like blocking it. There's like a war, you know, in the ether. They talked about ghosts and places being haunted. We got to get through this episode before it just crashes and everything gets deleted. Wait, what? Hi. Hi, hi. And to think I wanted to be a child star when I was a kid. I take all that back. It breaks my heart with you. Jeanette, Drake, et cetera, went through power to survivors. Thank you so much. Yeah, no, we, you know, public figures at the end of the day, still human, still can have trauma, can still have bad, horrific things happen to them. And it's important for all of us to take note of that, especially when we are speaking about them in these like public forums, right? We have to be very careful when we're speaking about them in public forums because we can kind of forget that these people we're seeing on a screen are real. You know, like you can, they're real. They're not AI <laughs> generated. They're real people. They're real people. And we have to be careful about objectifying any human life. Okay, so let's finish this. We'll, we'll keep reading Kate Taylor and then we're gonna watch this trailer and we're gonna sum it up and then I'm gonna tell you what is coming up next. So Schneider parted ways with Nickelodeon in 2018. Russell Hicks, Nickelodeon's former president of content and production said in a statement to BI in 2022, that all of Schneider's work was carefully scrutinized and approved. Good to know. Nickelodeon's complicit. Quiet on Set features exclusive interviews with former child stars and crew members from Schneider's shows, many of whom are speaking publicly for the first time. You can watch the new footage featuring Belle below. Okay, so we're gonna watch this. I'm gonna mute it here in the beginning because they say a couple things that will just make this not be able to reach more people. So I'm gonna start it here and I'll, I'll unmute it once we get past the point. About who was being hurt. Who it is, when it happened, where it happened. I have no idea. It wasn't dealing with anybody on the shows or anything, right? It was a child actor. On one of our shows? Y yes, by the way. I love that he's shocked by that. It's like, yeah. Yeah. You don't know? Like, you who, and I actually don't even know who, I can't even recognize who this person is. I hope someone tells me in the chat who this person is. Like, he looks so familiar, but I can't pinpoint who he is. So please let me know in the chat if you... Um, okay, be respectful in the chat, please. Okay, let's continue. Yes.
that just that sit down and and I guess that sit down happened you know after I did my interview because just as a reminder I was um, pregnant with truth during the filming of this you know documentary and we didn't even know like there were some days where I was like I don't know if this is going to see the light of day um is this going to happen and you know him taking that seat You feel, or, or for me personally, I feel the gravity of him taking the seat for the sense of this documentary being able to be shown to the world. And for Nickelodeon to finally be exposed for how they have treated and allowed people to be treated on their sets. And so that sit down is just extremely, it's a lot. It's a lot. So, you know, yes, obviously there's a lot of mixed feelings when it comes to Drake Bell. And at the same time, I would like to say to Drake Bell that you should be allowed and supported to finally tell your story. We all deserve that at the end of the day. And so that's my kind of like, you know, message to um, Drake Bell. What I honestly was very confused by though was when I saw in the Boy Meets um, World crew. Um, now you have to remember, obviously the Boy Meets World actor or whatever, he obviously knew this doc is coming out and the person's finally sitting down and, you know, um, telling their story. And I respect that the Boy Meets World actor is explaining and coming to the world about what happened there when it came to his involvement, I guess, during the uh, court case during the conviction. And though at the same time, it just hurts as survivors that, you know, these people don't care to necessarily, I don't want to say you don't care, <laughs> but I'm going to say it. Don't really care to talk about the fact that you did X, Y, and Z when it came to um, somebody who has harmed a child and hasn't, didn't come forward about it earlier. You know what I mean? Oh, sorry, what happened? Oh, no. Bizarre. Well, let me know when I'm back on, I guess. Am I back on? I think I am. <laughs> Everyone's saying it's good. I'm like, what's happening? <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll try to I'll, I'll try to wrap this up since there is obviously some like wild things happening with the internet or like with the OBS. But what was I saying? Okay, uh, when it comes to Boy Meets World, so it's 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 a bummer, honestly, that this person didn't come um, forward sooner, and that sadly it takes the fear maybe of of what happened coming out and you not having your voice heard, obviously, when it comes to how people can view it as enabling, right, Brian Peck, that he waited until now. I would, as a survivor, 20 something years later is upsetting to me. Honestly, I feel like that would have been my first episode of the Boy Meets World, whatever, podcast would be like, I need to get this off 
my chest before I even begin with this. You know what I mean? It just really, I wouldn't be able to, I don't know. I just wouldn't be able to, to talk or to do anything until I got that off my chest. So I find it very interesting timing, but at the same time, I will respect that this person has come forward. It's just really lagging, huh? Um, has come forward and, you know, that's that. So let's see if, if I play it, I just want to see if I, is it here? It was after Boy Meets World. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I, I mean, this was the type of thing where the person he presented was this great, funny guy who was really good at his job. Um, and you wanted to hang out with again. I didn't hang out with him a lot socially, but we were on four different shows together on sets oh, all the time. I did. I mean, we hung out all the time. Yeah. You hung out socially, right? Yeah. So that's oh, the thing the is, that, but that's because I didn't, I mean, I just didn't have much of a social life because I was mm -hmm. in my house, but mm -hmm. I saw him every day, hung out with him every day, talked to him every day. Okay. And you're like, okay, okay. And I, and I, and I appreciate him, you know, saying that. And also let's like make sure that we are definitely centering, you know, the, 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 the victim of Brian Peck during this time. And I, I have a feeling that we're going to end up hearing a lot about maybe there is more than just the boy meets world actor who, um, was broomed into enabling, you know, him during the hearing. I think we're going to probably hear a lot more kind of like how it ended up happening with the Danny Masterson case where we ended up reading these character witness letters. And I I'm very curious to see if Dan Schneider wrote a character witness letter. I'm very curious to see who ended up writing a character witness letter when it came to Brian Peck. And so we, I'm, we're probably going to end up seeing that. And I'm scared because and at the same time, I think it's really important for the world to understand, you know, when you go up against somebody who is a powerful figure in one way or another, they have a lot of people protecting them. They have a lot of people around them that are willing to write character letters, you know, et cetera, who, you know, supporting them with no shame, honestly. And so that's going to be really interesting where are we at? Oh, Peachy Streams, Gifted Five. Well, that's a perfect time to actually talk about memberships. Um, you know, just to let everyone know here, ePredators Daily has no corporate sponsorship. Um, this is completely community built. Every single person is building, you know, what this is. Um, and so if you want to become a member of YouTube, there's three different tiers of that. There's the Munchies, the Dinner Party, and Chef's Kiss. And all those tiers give specific perks. The Chef's Kiss is for Hard Feelings with Jeanette McCurdy. We're listening to the podcast, each episode, reflecting on our own individual hard feelings and also Jeanette McCurdy's. And it's really nice to boost. Before that, we were reading Britney Spears' um, The Woman in Me book, which was an incredible book club that we all did together. But with Hard Feelings, it's honestly been really wonderful to do this with the community and to create space to talk about our own hard feelings in the world and not always feel like we have to show up as perfect um, or as the American way of how are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. Um, and so that's the chef's kiss. Then the dinner party, we're still like rearranging what everything is, is because we discontinued the discord community for reasons that I've spoken about in previous episodes. And now what we're doing is we're still going to have every Friday be members only um, but it's not going to be within the Discord. It's just going to be through YouTube within the live chat. Um, and we're doing social change now. Um, and probably I'm going to do maybe some private recaps when it comes to, you know, the upcoming documentary. We can watch different clips. Um, and so that will also be happening for, for members only. And so if you want to become a member or you just became a member, thanks to Peachy Streams, thank you so much for being here and, you know, even liking even turning your notifications on, even sharing this video to anyone um, really helps spread awareness when it comes to uh, survivors and um, empowering them. So thank you so much for, thank you so much for being here. All right, so moving on, where are we at? So March 18th, 
March 18th, no, March 17th. March 17th is when the two episodes air. Um, they won't be streaming on March 17th. They'll just be live cable. Like you're not gonna be able to stream them on the 17th. You won't, you'll be able to stream them on the 18th, but I actually have YouTube TV and so I will be able to watch it live. So I might be doing a members only live of uh, the gathering with my friends there because I need emotional support during this time and so my mom is so wonderful and she's gonna be watching the kids and I'm gonna be having some friends over, Melanie's coming over. And so I'll, we'll probably do a little quick Q&A for members only, you know, during the, the episode release. And then the next day is another two episodes where we're gonna hear Drake Bell speak for the first time and then is the Nickelodeon protest. And please, 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 if you can, be there virtually. If you can't be at the protest physically, please be there virtually so that we can show Nickelodeon and the entertainment industry how many people care about creating a safer environment within the entertainment industry. So even if you're not able to come physically, please watch it virtually. It's gonna be 12 to two um, on the 19th and let's make some noise. Let's stand up for survivors everywhere. Let's stand up for survivors of Nickelodeon. And I'm really looking forward to seeing you all there. I know Christian's gonna be there, which I'm looking forward to seeing Christian. And I'm looking forward to seeing everyone and Melanie. And you know, so Thursday we'll be talking about P Diddy. We'll be talking about Corey Feldman. I have a lot to say about him recently. And then moving on, we're gonna be doing recap episodes of the Dan Schneider documentary. Cause I'm gonna be watching this all right alongside with all of you. I was not there for everyone's interview. So each moment of this is going to be a surprise. And so thank you so much to this community for being there for one another and supporting survivors and empowering them and uplifting their voices and celebrating them even when it's difficult to do so. So I really appreciate all of you and <laughs> sorry about the technical difficulties and I will see you all on Thursday.